There's a great deal of interest about small modular reactors in Canada the, these days, and especially with the provincial governments like Alberta and Saskatchewan. And uh, we're going to talk to Simon Newton from Moltex, a UK-based firm that has research going on in New Brunswick and hopes to build at least one reactor in Canada in the 2030s. So welcome to the interview, Simon. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Let's, we got a lot of ground to cover in a short period of time. So let's, uh, can you give us a brief overview of Moltex, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Moltex was formed in the UK in 2014. Um, the basis for forming the company was, uh, that was the time that a construction deal was announced for a large nuclear reactor in the UK. Um, with a fixed price for the energy that it was going to produce that was very high. And our founder, a guy called Ian Scott, wondered how come nuclear power had got so expensive. Um, and in researching that question, he came across you know, and reviewed a number of alternative technologies to the one that we, we all know and operate at the moment. One of which was um, a technology known as molten salt reactors. Um, and to understand why we think those are a much better idea, I think it's worth understanding that current technology, nuclear power, pressurized water reactors or light water reactors, whatever they get called, um, have two main hazards that they have to contain. The one, is, one is very high pressures and the other is radioactive gases. So if you have a radioactive gas at a very high pressure, then clearly the release of that pressure is an event that you definitely don't want to happen. It's what happened in Chernobyl, actually. And um, the nuclear industry at the moment is astonishingly safe. It's probably the safest form of power generation there is, but that safety comes at quite a high cost. So there are a lot of containment systems, a lot of backup, a lot of backup for the backup and so forth. That means that you wrap this simple physical reaction around with layer upon layer upon layer of safety. Now with molten salt reactors and with some other technologies, uh, the reaction takes place at atmospheric pressure and radioactive gases are not a byproduct. And so there's no gas and anyway, there's no pressure. And that makes a massive difference from an engineering point of view, therefore from a cost and point of view. And so if you like, that's the basis for the setting up of the company back then and the patents that we have generated on, on our own form of molten salt reactor. Well, let's talk about one of the three uh, nuclear technologies that your company is working on, and that's thorium reactors. I, I understand that thorium is a replacement for uranium. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and thorium is probably the one we, we see as being the furthest away, if you like. There was a lot of interest in thorium um, uh, many years ago, partly because it appeared that uranium might be running out. But actually, what we now know about the, the uh, availability of uranium in the world suggests that that's perhaps not as urgent a problem as we once thought. Um, but these reactor technologies will use thorium as a fuel. And in a sense, it's an answer to that question, well, is this really a renewable source of energy or not? There's sufficient thorium in the world to generate to cover our energy requirements for tens of thousands of years and so even after uranium gets used up which, which itself will last for many thousands of years then thorium potentially comes later so from a reactor point of view that's not the one we're working on most most actively at the moment but that's the technology will do that now, the, the, uh, the second uh, technology is the waste burner, which I understand uh, is, will be designed to burn the waste from can-do reactors. And I think that's probably one of the uh, biggest objections to uh, nuclear power is the creation of this radioactive waste. Can you tell us you know, how that works, that, uh, that your design will be able to use spent waste from, from other uh, you know, nuclear reactors? Sure. Um, in, in a standard nuclear reactor, as well as creating a lot of energy, um, what you create is some, some radioactive byproducts as well, one of which is plutonium. And plutonium is not a naturally occurring element. Right? It's only created in the current generation of nuclear reactors. And plutonium and some other similar um, elements 
are very radioactive for a very long period of time. And that's why the waste from those reactors uh, is radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years. Now, it can be dealt with. It's dealt with perfectly safely. Um, but again, there's quite a high cost of dealing with that waste. We can recycle that waste, put it through a, a series of chemical processes that splits out the plutonium and what are called the other higher actinides, i.e. the more, the larger radioactive elements, and incorporates it into fuel for our reactor. What you're left with from the can-do spent fuel is a set of um, elements which are much more easy to deal with. Quite a lot of it's reusable, so, um, so you get a lot of zirconium out, which you can reuse. You get a uranium alloy out, which is very easy to look after. And then you get um, about 1%, a fraction under 1% of the volume is, is still high-level waste. But A, it's only 1%, so it's a hundredth of what you started with. And, and B, it's only radioactive for 300 years. And so um, our... Uh, hope, our view, is that by recycling can-do spent fuel, we can very substantially reduce the costs that would otherwise be incurred in looking after it. Now, this has got to be attractive to governments like Ontario, where they've had nuclear reactors for decades and they've, they have spent waste that they have to store and, and worry about. And is that one of the reasons why you're getting, uh, you know, your technology is getting interest from jurisdictions, you know, uh, where they already have nuclear reactors. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and it, and it's why the federal government's so supportive as well, um, because as you said, I think you know the, what, what's the major public objection to to nuclear power? It's it's usually something to do with waste. Not not by the way that the waste is actually as big a problem as a lot of people think it is, but nonetheless, it's an expensive problem. And so, um, yeah, that's the, it's the social license we get from being able to deal with that waste. I mean, the, the fleet of candy reactors in Canada, by the end of its life, will have produced enough waste to power six gigawatts of our reactors for 60 years. So that's an enormous amount of, you know, extra clean energy that can be generated from a resource that otherwise would have to be very expensively stored for a very long period of time. Now let's talk about the third uh, reactor, which is the uh, uranium-fueled uh, reactor. What can you tell us about that? Well, so th so this is uh, you know, um, I say the drawing board. The engineers would kill me because, of course, there isn't a drawing board. But it, it's in the early design stages. Um, uh, clearly, the the market for the waste-burning reactor is entirely defined by the amount of waste there is in the world, and not every country or province that needs nuclear power necessarily has a resource of existing spent fuel and so the uranium burning reactor is designed to deal with those kind of opportunities it it, it also is a molten salt reactor it uses many of the same principles as the waste burner it's a related and, and overlapping kind of technology um, and it's you know we're working on its development now but we're in the early stages of that compared to the to the waste burner um it's potentially quite exciting though so we're hoping to have more we can say about that perhaps in you know another year or so's time so we've got the uh, the three technologies that you're you're working on and uh you your plan is to build a plant a, uh, if i understand a waste burner plant at the uh, Point Le Pro uh, site in New Brunswick by the early 2030s. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, so we, we, we were, we're lucky to be working with New Brunswick Power. Um, they performed, a, they actually looked at 90 organizations with designs for small modular reactors. I mean, there are, there's a lot of companies out there, right? And they selected two, which they intend to implement, um, ours and a company called ARC. And um, their selection is part of an overall Canada action plan for SMRs, uh, which, of which they have something called Stream 2, advanced reactors. Stream 1 is being run in Ontario, which is to try and build a reactor by the late 2020s at Darlington. And then Stream 3 
is a specific category called micro reactors, i.e. very small reactors that might be used for isolated communities or individual um, industrial plants or whatever, typically less than 10 megawatts kind of output. So New Brunswick Power, if you like, have taken on the job on behalf of, of, of the nuclear industry in Canada to implement advanced reactors at Point the Pro, and we're one of those. And so we're going through that, that process, you know, design, R&D, licensing, and so forth. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you a question, uh, Simon, uh, and it comes out of a study that came out about a couple months ago, and uh, Jason Dion, an economist with the uh, Institute for Climate Choices, wrote it, and he had two types of, te of uh, energy technologies that governments are looking at. One is uh, the sure bets, like an electric vehicle, you know, that is going to be uh, successful in the marketplace. And then he had wild cards, and he's, SMRs are wild cards in his, his view. And these are te uh, technologies that we can't count on but we should work on because they had hold a great deal of promise. So, you know, small modular reactors. In your opinion, if this is a wild card, what are the chances that your company is going to be successful? And I know this is a bit of a loaded question. I apologize for that. But is it a high likelihood, a medium likelihood? Can you so that over to you? It's interesting, isn't it? That I think there's two ways of answering this question. Um, we've been generating absolutely carbon-free electricity from nuclear power for 70 years, right? all around the world, very safely. And yet everybody regards the technology as some sort of, you know, long shot, right? It, 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 which people inside the industry, I think, find quite difficult to cope with. It is true to say that current generation of nuclear power is, is, is quite high cost, certainly very high capital cost. And that you know SMRs have have the potential um, to reduce those costs and to make a more flexible and lower cost contribution, and that's definitely true. You know the real answer to the question is, you know the physics works, right? SMRs will work, um, whether they'll whether every one of those ninety companies will be successful or not is a, is, a, is another question, right? Um, but some of them definitely will. And at the moment in Canada, there are, well, there's two of us, two or three in Ontario. You know, there's maybe five or six organisations. Um, the, the Canadian need for electricity could easily provide, a, you know, a substantial market to all of those companies. So we don't see this as a race where it's only going to have one winner. You know, this is, this is about creating an industry, actually. Um, and we, you know, are confident we're going to be a big part of that. So, uh, are, are you saying that you, in your company's point of view, there is a high likelihood that your efforts are going to uh, result in a cost effective, like a low cost, an SMR that produces electricity at low cost and is able to use the, uh, the waste from, from can do's as you plan? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, because we're not, we are, it's not like fusion, right? I would think of fusion as a wild card because there's quite a lot of science still to be done. We don't have science to do. We've got a bit of engineering to do. Or, you know, how do you make it robust and how do you make it last for long enough and so forth? But the science is absolutely there. That's a yeah, sorry, so, sorry, Mark, I'm gone, gone. Well, I, I, this is a very key point that I hadn't considered before, Simon, because we see that with batteries. Once batteries, lithium ion batteries moved from the emphasis on science to the emphasis on, on engineering, then they began to scale up and costs came down and improvement energy density went up and so on. So yeah. is, that, is that an analogy here that's, that SMRs like nuclear is like batteries, the science is done and now, it's, we're, now the, we need to do the engineering, which we have clever engineers. So yeah. So absolutely, that's right. And actually, it's interesting you raise batteries, because the other thing I was going to say was, you look at what other solutions we have uh, for the mass massive scale generation of clean energy. Uh, it's either with fossil fuels and carbon capture on a huge scale, or with renewables and energy storage on a huge scale, or with nuclear. 
And actually, you sh you could argue by the same if SMRs are a wild card in, in, in that picture, so is pretty much everything else. And so we might be in a position where wild cards is all we've got. And on that note, uh, we'll close the interview. Thank you very much, Simon. Plenty of insights here. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. I've enjoyed it.